Praise the Lord. Y'all pray for me this morning as I sing. Until I was 27 years of age, and, and at that point, God got God got through my old hard heart, and God showed me that I was on the wrong road, that I was His, but I had been running from Him for so long, and that and that I and I needed to turn around because He the, the line was coming up where He was just now take me out of this off this planet. I was quickly approaching that point, and thank God He got through to me, and I turned around, and when I did, you know, He was right there. He'd been right there behind me the whole time waiting on me to turn around. And he threw his arms around me. And, it, and, it, and I've been walking with him ever since. And I praise God for that. Take your Bible. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 6 this morning. Uh, we're going to revisit. I, you may remember this message and you may not. That's okay if you don't remember. That's, that's, that's fine. 
because uh, I'm going to preach it again this morning. Amen. Uh, I shared this one a couple years ago, I think it was. But, uh, and, and I run up on it and I said, well, I've already got that message. I ain't got to get that one together. Praise God. I thank God for that because I had a funeral this week. So that worked out just about right. But, but you pray for me this morning as we turn to Galatians chapter 6. And we're going we're gonna to look there at verses 7 through 9. i got to find it in my Bible. Galatians chapter 6 and verses 7 through 9. <coughs> have you found that this morning? If you have, say amen. 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 Well, it's good to be in church with you. Amen. It is good to be in church. I feel like I've been in church. I was in church yesterday, what it felt like, uh, preaching that whole time and, and singing and, and things. So it's good. It's, I, I enjoy it. I don't want to go to a funeral every day, but I tell you what, I, I wouldn't mind having church every day. It, it suits me just fine to preach every day. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 9. Have you found it? If you have, we're going to read. The Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love you. I thank you this morning. I thank you for the Word of God. I thank you, Lord, for the message that's here before me. Lord, I know what a powerful message it can be. Lord, I pray folks would open their hearts to receive it. Lord God, I pray you'd empower it, and I pray you'd drive it into our hearts and remind us daily that our life that we live as believers, oh, what an impact it has on us. And Lord God, I pray that we would be mindful of that, and Lord, careful in our walk with you. Lord, please help us to be careful to, to follow you and obey you, Lord, so that we have your blessing on our life, Lord, so that we're able to walk in victory. But, Lord, help us to get through these times of reaping. Lord, help us to understand what the Word of God is teaching us today. Use it, Lord, to shape us and mold us into what you want us to be. And we'll be careful to give you the glory and the praise. Lord, we're thankful for these that are here, thankful for these that will watch us online. Lord, we ask your blessing now on all of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, praise the Lord. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a companion scripture. If you can turn over and put your finger in that place after we read it, if you want to turn back to it and read it later. Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. That's over in the crispy pages again over there where you probably hadn't been in a long time. Hosea chapter 10. I, I got it in front of me. I'll read it to you. Verses 12 and 13. Just here, this, y'all just listen. Don't spend your time turning. So to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Ye have plowed wickedness, ye have reaped iniquity, ye have eaten the fruit of lies, because thou didst trust in thy way in the multitude of thy mighty men. <clears throat> now, Again, let's read our text. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Now, you know something I don't like. I don't like unpredictable people. I don't like to be around unpredictable people. I have had unpredictable people in my life, and they, they always unnerve you because you can't trust them, you can't count on them. And the people that I, when I look back over the course of my life, the people that mean the most to me, the people that stand out in my mind as people that, that you know, I, I really have a deep respect and love for, those are people that you can count on. Those people are the ones you count on to be the same person, rain or shine, good or bad, they don't change. They're the same every time you see them. That's the way, that's the way my grandparents were. They didn't change. They were the same. You know? and, and the people from that generation, they, they tend to be more steady than people today. People today, young people today, you don't know what they're going to be from one moment to the next. They're ruled by their emotions. They're flighty and everything else. I'm not saying all of them, but a lot of them are that way. But unpredictable people scare me. Like I said, I, I just you, you don't never know what you're going to get from one day to the next. 
And aren't you glad God isn't like that? Amen. Aren't you glad God's consistent? Amen. Aren't you glad God didn't just, just change his mind and say, you know, I think I'll send some of these people to hell today. I know they're saved, but they messed up and I'm mad at them and I'm going to send them to hell. Aren't you glad God doesn't just wake up in a bad mood and decide to do that? Hey, man, I am too. Thank God. You know, God doesn't change, folks. God is what we call Im immutable. That means he cannot change. And our immutable God is so sure of what he's going to do that he wrote it down in his book. I'm going to do this, period. And he will because God doesn't change. He's immutable. He gave you a written copy of a contract between you and him which states, and he says, if you do this, I'll do that. You got it right there in the book. You have his written word, and, and he will never back up on what he says he'll do. Amen. Amen. He will never change from what he said he will do. And I, and I know we've all heard preaching from this text this morning. We've all heard uh, uh, preaching from, from verse 8, which says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. And, and, I, and I know that we've heard preaching on that where preachers barking and, and saying, Sinners, you're going to get what's coming to you. God's going to send you to hell for your sins. If you sow your flesh, you love your flesh, reap corruption. And that's the absolute truth. But that's not what the text is saying. That's the absolute truth. Yes, if you ignore if you ignore salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ and you persist in your sins, you'll split hell wide open, you'll burn forever. Period. But that's not what this is saying. And context is king. If you don't know what context is, then you're lost as a as a blind goose in a hailstorm. You don't know what you're doing. And and we need to understand. And and the way the key to the context of this passage is for us to look at verse 1 and look at the first word. What's that first word? Brethren. Brethren. So who does that say that this is written to? Uh, Christians. Yeah. Not lost people, but believers is who this is written to. When it says brethren, here, if a man be overtaken in a fault. Okay, so he's talking about believers. So I want you to understand that Galatians 6 is not a threat to unbelievers. Although it's been used that way, that's not what this chapter is about. It is not a threat to unbelievers. Galatians 6 is an explanation to a believer. It's an explanation. It's not intended to terrify lost sinners. It's intended to help a born-again child of God understand what is going on in my life right now. Okay? That's what this is here for. Paul is demonstrating how a supernatural process is very similar to a natural process. That of sowing and reaping, going out in this time of year, out there where you busted up the ground and putting your seeds in and waiting and a harvest comes up. This is what he's comparing all this to. Okay? So listen, let's get into this. Number one, I want you to understand something. You will always reap like you have sown. You will always reap like you have sown. Always. Whatever is planted is what you're going to get. I have, I have planted corn, I have planted tomatoes, I have planted beans, I have planted squash. I, one time I planted some uh, sugar cane, and it's amazing, this is a funny story, my kids, my boys were younger, my boys were probably, oh, they were probably 12, I had 12 and 11, and they were out going to work in the garden with me, and my son Jesse, I sent him out there to, to weed, and he hoed up an entire row of, of sugar cane. He said, I thought that was weeds, Daddy. I said, you thought that was weeds growing in a line? <laughs> anyway, hold every one of them up. I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but I just want to grow some sugar cane. But anyway, uh, but the Bible tells us we're going to reap what we sow. And again, you won't plant potatoes and get tomatoes. You won't plant butter beans and get squash. What you put in the ground is what's coming up. And let me say this to you. If you sow in your life, in the area of sexual sin, you commit adultery, you commit fornication, you will reap back in that area of sexual sin. It will come back to you somehow in your life. You will end up wishing you had never done that before because it will, it will pay off in spades in your life somehow or another. Don't ever go down that road. 
If you sow in the area of your mind, and, and when I say that, I mean letting in doubts and fears and letting in lies and all those kinds of things, you're going to reap there. That stuff will come back to haunt you. The Bible is very clear. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Okay? And, and, and look here. Maybe you've been a pretty good person. Maybe you haven't been a terrible sinner. Maybe you've lived a decent life and a pretty moral life and you follow the Lord pretty good. And that's great. Hallelujah. Praise God for that. But in the areas that you have sinned, you're going to reap. You're going to reap. Number two, let me say this to you. You will always reap larger than you sow. You'll always reap larger than you sow. Y'all know how big a tomato seed is, right? Yeah. They're pretty tiny. You probably hold up, you know, four or five hundred of them in your hand in a pile. Kind of small. Wouldn't, wouldn't be a whole lot of good on a salad, would it? No. <laughs> but if you plant one seed in the good ground, just one seed, one little tiny flake. I mean, ain't no bigger than, uh, than you scratch off a little scab on your hand. So it ain't big as nothing. But, but you plant one of them in the ground, it's going to reproduce many, many times over. Can I tell you something? I planted back in 2012, I planted a Max Wild Cherry. Those cher them cherry tomatoes, I mean, they're like, they're like little marbles. Man's in the sweetest, it almost tastes like ketchup. It, it's just missing the salt. But everything else in that thing, if you put a little salt on it, it tastes like ketchup. They're that good. Okay? I planted one vine in 2012. I still get matched wild cherry tomatoes every year and always in a different spot. Always in a different spot. You will always reap larger than you sow. <laughs> When you sow to your flesh, you're always going to reap larger than you sowed. we got a generation coming up that has tremendously sowed to their flesh. we got young people today growing up. They think nothing. They just live wild and do what they want to do. And, and they think there will be no consequences. But I tell you what, they're going to find out that God's right. And if you sow to your flesh tremendously, you're going to reap even more tremendously. Most people look at what's occurring today and they scratch their heads and they say, I don't understand how this happened. I don't understand why we're going through all the things that we're going through. Well, just consider how the last few generations have sown to their flesh and you'll understand why we're going through all the wickedness and the hell on earth that we're, that we're going through these days. That's why we've got such sin running rampant in this world. Why? Because we've had a, our generation and the one before us and the one after us have sown wildly to their flesh. And if you sow to your flesh, it may only take a minute. It may only take a minute, and it may seem like nothing. But you can count on the fact that you're going to continue to reap corruption a lot longer than you have sowed it. Like I said, you plant a tomato seed, it'll continue to produce tomatoes under frost. You know, again, and, and your sin will continue to show back up in your life. It will, Because, again, you sow it, it's going to reap. And, and number four, I gave you number three, you always reap longer than you sowed. I didn't give you the, the third one, but that's what it was. Number four, you will reap later than you sowed. i tell you what I don't like. I don't like when I have planted my seed to go out there in a day or two and go, I don't see nothing coming up. I bet that seed ain't no good. I bet they sold me some bad seed. That seed, it ought to come. I'm impatient, you know, aren't you? When you plant something, you're ready to come. If you plant my seed, you're ready to come up. You want to see it. Give me some proof that I did some good. I want to, I want to see if there's something there. I mean, we live in that kind of world, right? I mean, when, I know when, when some of y'all was kids, it was a slower world, but it's gotten faster, hasn't it? Microwaves and drive throughs and, and everything. I, I always talk about uh, seeing that Rolex commercial on TV where the guy goes, Rolex. R O A L I A I D S, how you spell it or whatever. And he, he draws a chalk line under it. And he stands in front of a blackboard. He talks about Rolex for 30 seconds and it never cut away. And he tells you all about it. Rolex spells relief. Now you go to Rolex commercial, it's zipping by your face. Car commercials, it's every, two, every half second they change in the frame. And everything has sped up. Again, we live in a drive through, fast, get it done uh, world. 
And, and nobody wants to wait. We're impatient, waiting for things to happen, you know. And some, and, and some people may be thinking, well, you know what? You say, you say all these things are coming, but I did all kinds of horrible, mean, nasty things before I got saved. And nothing like you're talking about ever happened to me. Yet. Yet. See, I want to help you this morning. I want to try to get help, give you some help so you understand what may be going on in your life. Paul writes in chapter 6, verse 8, He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. Okay? That, that, that's a narrow spectrum of sin that he's referring to. Now, I want you to understand something. The same man that wrote chapter 6 also wrote chapter 5. Okay, and over in chapter five, we talk. We see in there in chapter five the the fruit, the works of the flesh. All those works of the flesh are right there, and uh, from verses nineteen on down on down to the end of the chapter, the, the works of the flesh versus the works of the spirit. You can go back and look at them when you get ready to. But but what he's trying to tell us, he's saying. He, he, he remembers what he wrote in chapter 5. In chapter 5, verse 19, he gives that list of the sins of the flesh. And I'm not going to go through them again because we read them last week. They're right there. But they're the works of the flesh, and it's, it's bad things. right? It's adultery and fornication and so on. And, and all that idolatry and witchcraft, I said I'm going to read them. I'm not going to read all of them. But, they're, but it's, it's things that we know are, wi are wicked and things that we ought not do. And I want you to understand something. If you are in chapter 5, if you look in chapter 5, down through those sins, 19 and following, you say, oh, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. If you're in chapter 5, you're in chapter 6. If you're in chapter 5, you're included in chapter 6. And now, there are some unpleasant truths about sowing and reaping. And God's people need some help on this subject so we understand. If you sow to your flesh, you are going to reap corruption. This is God's written contract between us and He. And He's not going to change it just because you don't like it. <coughs> so let me, let me give you an explanation of what happens most times, okay? Somebody will get saved, and they'll start coming to church regular. Everything's going good. They're, getting, they're happy in the Lord and excited about being saved and they, they're fellowshipping with other Christians at church and having the best time, and then all of a sudden the bottom just drops out. Some terrible something happens in their life. And, and they begin to question, why would God let something like this happen in my life? Why? I don't understand. I'm trying to live for God. I don't understand. Why is this happening? Somebody gets pregnant unexpected. Well, it shouldn't be unexpected. We know how that happens. But something like that will take place. Or, or somebody loses their job. Or, or, or your kids go astray. Or, or the spouse files for divorce unexpectedly. Or, or somebody finds out you committed a crime and now you've got to pay for it. And, 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 you know, you can try to hide all that stuff, but it's going to come out. Okay, these things are going to happen. You say, well, I thought everything would be perfect since I got saved. I thought everything would be great in my life. Is... Listen, you were running with the devil, and now you've turned around and you're headed the opposite direction. You're going to butt heads with that joker. Don't you know that? You're going to butt heads with him. He said, preacher, I just don't understand why these things are happening to me. I thought when I got saved, God forgave me for all those things. I thought he washed my sins away. Why, preacher? Why? Why is this happening i tell you why. Because he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's why. It's an unconditional statement. There ain't nothing you can do about it. If you find yourself in chapter 5 sowing to your flesh, then you'll find yourself in chapter 6 reaping corruption. It's just that's the way it is. And you say, well, is God being mean to me? No, God's not being mean to you when he causes you to reap corruption. He's not abusing you. He's not mishandling you. He's not mistreating you in any way. He's given you plenty of warning about all of this in His Word. And this message is not a feel-good message. Like last week's was a feel-good message. This is not. This is a feel-ooh message. I don't know if I like it or not message, but it's a serious message. It's a somber, sobering, and a fearful message. And it will get scary, and it will get dark before it gets better, I'm going to tell you. But praise God, it gets better at the end. 
Our nature is not to pay attention until we have to. And, and we usually remain stupid until pain gets involved. And it's, oh, and i got to do something about this because it hurts, you know. And let me ask you this, and be, be honest with me. How many of you, when you were a little kid, put something metal into an electrical outlet to see what would happen? <laughs> Raise your hand if you did. Didn't like it, did you? How many of you... In your, in your parents' car, or in your car, I don't know if it was your parents or not, you pushed that little cigarette lighter down, and you played with it, looked at it, watched it glow red, and you thought it had cooled off, and then you touched it. You didn't do that twice, did you? Right. You touched the stove, you didn't go back for another field. Amen? You ate a, if you ate a green persimmon, you never went back for a second one, did you? No. See, we learn. We learn. And, and we don't learn until we feel it. <laughs> you know? It, it, God will give you mercy. Mercy to endure the reaping. Amen. With God's mercy, you can reap any corruption. With God's mercy. God's Word is filled with God's words. God is perfect and His Word is perfect. And He chooses perfect words to teach us what He's saying. And God did not make any mistake when He chose the word corruption. Okay? He's not discussing forgiveness. He would have said sin. Okay? He's not discussing forgiveness of sins. He's discussing corruption. All right? He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. There's four major differences between forgiveness and corruption. All right, I'm going to give them to you. Number one, forgiveness is spiritual. Corruption is physical. Forgiveness is spiritual. Corruption is physical. You can reap corruption in your body while your heart is right with God. You, you may be going through something horrible that is a result of something that happened later on in your life, but you can stay close to God through that reaping of corruption. Number two, forgiveness is immediate. It's immediate and it's spontaneous. As soon as I confess it, it is immediate. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's immediate and spontaneous, but corruption is usually delayed and comes later on in the future. I'm giving Shirley time to finish writing. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> Number three. Forgiveness is eternal. Hallelujah. God forgives, he don't bring it up later. Amen? Amen. God's not a wife. <laughs> I say that jokingly. Amen, not all do that. Some do, others don't. But God, God forgives, and it's over. And, and, and again, it's as if it didn't happen. But corruption, corruption is just temporary. Forgiveness is eternal, but corruption is temporary. How long will God forgive me? He'll forgive me forever. If he ever forgave me, he'll forgive me forever. Okay? All right, so forgiveness is forever. God's unconditional promises showing, uh, concerning sowing and reaping are universal to every one of his children. It's not that some of us are special and others are not. Everybody, it applies to everybody. Uh, God does not take away corruption when he saves you. Wouldn't that be nice? I mean, he washed it when we sang all ago. For the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away. He did. He washed my sins away. As far as the record's clear, my record's clear. There's no more sin on my record because it's washed away. But if I continue to live in this sinful flesh and I continue to sin, that sin, God will never take me to hell for it. No, because Christ's blood was shed. It's paid for. But I will bear that sin in this flesh. You know, there are people who teach that when you get saved, you don't sin no more. 
they, they denominations teach that. Well, that's, that, ain't, that ain't the Bible. I'm sorry. They have to throw this whole chapter out if they're going to believe that. Uh, you know, and there's a lot of people who are still begging God to take away the corruption in their life. I got news for you. Praying for God to forgive you of the corruption in your life is a waste of your time. Because God is not going to forgive you what He told you He's going to cause you to reap. It's not, God's not going to say, well, we won't do that. You don't have to deal with that. No, He promised you if you do it, you're going to have to reap it. Can I give you a silly, simple example? If you get up in the middle of the night and your wife has made a double layer chocolate cake and it's sitting on the cake stand in the kitchen covered up and you sit down with a glass of milk and you eat the whole cake, she might forgive you, but you're still going to get fat. Okay? Them calories ain't going to go disappear just because you said, Lord, please forgive me for doing that. You're going to reap it. Amen? It's as simple as that. Corruption is the natural God-given response to sow into the flesh. Now, worship is not based on corruption. Worship is based on forgiveness. Our fellowship comes with God when I'm right with God. I can have corruption I'm still reaping out in my life that God already knew and God already told me about, and He still loves me and He still spends time with me even though I'm going through that. It's not going to interrupt our fellowship. I'll have to increase my prayer life and say, God, I need Your grace to get through this. God, I need you. It'll cause me to draw nearer to God and cling harder to Him as I'm going through the reaping of that corruption. But God's not going to take it out of my life. God will give me His grace and His peace while I go through it. <clears throat> now, four truths about reaping corruption. Four truths about reaping corruption. Everybody on the sound of my voice, whether you're here or whether you're listening in, needs this. So please pay attention. You can be, like I said, in full fellowship with God and at the same time reap corruption. You can, Like I said, you can have communion with Him. You can spend time with Him. You can draw nearer to Him while you're going through that corruption. And there's plenty of preachers in America. I promise you there are plenty of preachers in America who have embezzled thousands of dollars from their churches or even millions of dollars from their churches, had sex with a minor, were prosecuted, sit in a penitentiary, having sought and found the forgiveness of the Lord and having fellowship with God behind the bars of a penitentiary, but they will finish their prison sentences because they reaped and they're going to, they sowed it and they're going to reap it. God help us if that's the case in the world we live in. But it's true. If they found forgiveness with God, they can have fellowship with Him but they're going to have to finish the corruption reaping. Number two, corruption can't be forgiven, has to be reaped out, okay? If, 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 if a girl gets pregnant out of wedlock, she said, well, I didn't mean to. Well, you did. You still did it. You know what? God will forgive her, but she's going to have the baby. Amen. Listen, you may you may uh, you may have a terrible accident. You may you may do things to yourself through self abuse. You may do mental harm to yourself through drugs or alcohol. You know what? God will forgive you, and you can have fellowship with Him. But if you cause the damage, the damage is there. Corruption can't be forgiven. You did it to yourself, but God will love you all the way through it. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Isn't it good that God's faithful? And that God is just and that He'll do that and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And like I said, God and everybody else in your life may forgive you. You may have peace with everybody, but it will not put things back to the way they were before you sowed to your flesh. If you did something horrible, yes, there's forgiveness, but you can't undo what you did. You have to live with the consequences. Thirdly, corruption is always reaped in your flesh. What do you mean by that? I mean it doesn't affect you standing in heaven. Okay? 
Just because you've got to reap corruption out while you're living down here on this earth does not mean that it's going to change your standing in heaven, that God's going to give you any less blessing when you get there, that God's going to love you any less, or you'll enjoy heaven any less. It doesn't have anything to do with that. Corruption is a time-bound problem. It happens while we are down here. I, I put a lady in the ground yesterday, and I don't know a whole lot about her life, but I know she was a Christian. I'm, I, I'm sure she had trials and troubles, but guess what? When we put that box in the ground, all her troubles went down with her. She's in glory. She didn't take them home with her. Corruption is always reaped in the flesh. Now listen to me. Corruption's always reaped in the flesh, but there's a problem with that. It might not be in your flesh. You might make it through this life without reaping corruption. But listen here. If you got children, if you got grandchildren or great grandchildren, they may end up having to reap what you have sown. You say, How could that be? You ever heard of reputation? If you were the town scoundrel, you think that won't have any effect on your children's future? Listen, <clears throat> again, the Bible tells us, and I and, I'm, and I promise you, I, I, I don't I don't plan to to tell you that I understand everything this verse says, but I'll read to you what it says. Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is long-suffering of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. That's what the Bible says. And, and why that takes place, I can't tell you, but I can tell you that, the, that when, when, when daddy sins, children see it and they imitate daddy. Well, that's what Grandpa did. He, he made it fine. They don't hurt me. That's always running my family. We've always been that way. You just don't know. That's where that kind of stuff comes from, that ideology comes from. So, again, I told you about my Matt's Wild Cherry. I planted, I planted six collard green plants about four years ago. Okay? The frost killed all of them but one last year. That vine was looked as dead and dry as could be. But you know what happened? A few little collard green leaves popped up out of it. Next thing you know, I had two or three stalks growing up out of another stalk. Well, we had, a, we had another freeze this year. And I thought, that sucker's dead. It's dead. And the vine split. You know what happened in the split? Vines came out of it. You can't kill. It's like the corruption. It's not going to quit until it's done, you see. It's not going to quit until it's done. I see the repetition of some of my, my youthful sins in the lives of my children. It scares me to death because I know what I went through. I know, I know the devil tried to kill me. He tried to take my life. He put me through the ringer. And I don't want my children to have to go through that. It breaks my heart to see them go through it. But yet they do, some of them. You know? And, and again, these are, these are things that I not only live through, but I warn them, don't do that. Don't do what I did. Don't make the same mistakes I did. Oh, Daddy, i got to figure it out for myself. If you listened to me, you wouldn't have to. But i got to. What is that? They're, they're reaping some of my corruption is what they're doing. <clears throat> you ever been around one of them kind of people that like to brag on all the sinning they used to do when they were younger? Boy, oh, man, when we was younger, boy, we used to really get into some trouble. Boy, we used to really get after it. Boy, we used to, you know, we used to do this, that, and the other. You know, and, and again, they like to brag on how they were in their past. But the bad news is it ain't over yet. It ain't over till it's all over. And believe me, uh, I, brother, I, you know, we, we played them honky tonks. I, it scares me sometimes when I think about the places I've been and the things that I went through. It terrifies me because I don't want to keep reaping corruption. I've been out of that life for, for well over 20-something years. But I, I, I still, that stuff can keep coming back into your life. Just as sure as the sun don't come up in the morning, he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. It's coming whether you want it to or not. And the fourth thing, i got to hurry up because we're nearly out of town here. The fourth thing 
You cannot be so filled with the Holy Spirit that you no longer reap corruption. You can't get so close to God that it all goes away. Ephesians 5.18, the Bible says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So being a Holy Ghost-filled, shouting, serving, soul-winning child of God won't stop you from reaping corruption. It's as simple as that. You, you can be filled with the Spirit of God at the same time that you're going through it. You know lots of preachers have trouble-filled lives. Lots of preachers deal with all kinds of troubles they never tell you about. But they do. And why is that? Because of what they were before they was a preacher. I still, I still deal with things from my past. I, I still have thoughts from my past that I wish I didn't have. I still relive some of the things that I've done from time to time. I'll, I'll run into somebody on the street and it's somebody that I that I, I sinned with in the past. Somebody that, that I used to run with and used to do things I'd be ashamed of now. And, and, and when I see them, when I see them, I'm ashamed of myself because I remember how I influenced them. I, I, there's one person in particular, I won't call his name, but I saw him after probably 20-something years. I did his wedding. I, I actually did, uh, officiated his wedding. And I thought he had gotten saved. He, he told me he did. I saw him 20-something years later, and I, I apologized to him for leaving him down, down the road. I let him down. He told me, he laughed, and he slapped me on the back. He said, I was a lot worse than you thought I was back then. You didn't really do a whole lot of anything. And then I found out the guy don't even believe. He, he broke my heart. But that corruption working in his, I mean, it, I mean, it, it, it wouldn't let him hear the word. That corruption that was in him, wouldn't, he wouldn't hear it. He ignored it. And, and I'm telling you, that you say, well, that's him. But you know what? That burdens me. That's a corruption that still burdens me because of, uh, I think to myself, if I hadn't been who I was back then, he might have believed. It breaks my heart. But you know what? That's, that, this, this is not going to feel good. It won't ever feel good until it's done. And, and I'm going to say to you this morning, I'm not giving you this to scare you. Okay, this passage is here to help you to understand you 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 can't avoid reaping the corruption. Okay, but here's the thing. Here's here's the tor turning point in the message with three minutes to twelve. All right, corruption is good. You heard me right. Corruption is good, and you're sitting there going, "How can it be good?" How can that be good? I can tell you that's good. Number one, because God helps others through your pain. God helps others through your pain. Where your greatest pain is, where your greatest hurt is, listen to me, don't miss this, where your greatest hurt is can become your greatest ministry. Where you have been hurt in your life, where you have gone through pain and agony and suffering and have clung to God through it, you now have authority. You can speak on that to somebody who's now in the same situation. God has given you ministry through your pain. Where you have suffered, you now have a voice to speak on that subject. Where you have endured your greatest agony, you have the most authority. I used this illustration before, but, but some friends of mom's and, and, and mine as well, Roger and Vicki Powell in Paris, Texas, they started Paris Pregnancy Care Center to, to keep women from going and getting an abortion, to keep them, uh, to have their baby, even if they give it up an abortion, but to have the baby and to take care of them. They started that because of, of an abortion that they had before they were believers. And unplanned pregnancy and, and a horrible situation back then and God saved them and later on they got married and, and they started this ministry. They have a voice now to these women. Why? Because we've been there where you're at. So God helps others through your pain. Number two, you prove that God's Word is the authority and that He will do exactly what He, what he said He will do. My dad is a testimony to this truth. Back in 1998, my daddy found out he had cancer. He had a, he had a, well, he had one of lung that was full of tumors. 
he had a, a tumor on his bronchial tube. They went in and they shot it full of radiation, exploded the DNA in the cancer tumor, and they took out one lung. And uh, he went down to uh, Glory Baptist Church and talked to Brother Bill Dickey. He wanted to make sure he was saved. My daddy didn't live the greatest life. My daddy lived a rough life. My daddy lived a I'm going to do what I want to do life. It was not a Christian life. My daddy found out he was dying with cancer. He, he decided, I, want, I need to go make sure I'm on, I'm on my way to heaven. And, and he found peace with God concerning his sin, but it didn't take his cancer away. And I remember sitting there with him and, you know, sitting there in, in the later stages of his cancer and, and him saying to me, oh, wouldn't it be something if God was to heal me? Wouldn't it be something if God healed me? I said, yeah, daddy, that'd be something if God, if God were to heal you. I said, but you know, there's a great chance he ain't going to heal you. And if he don't heal you, if he don't heal you, how do you know for sure where you're going to heaven? I said, Daddy, are you trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior to take you to heaven when you die? And he looked at me and he said, well, I don't see no other, I don't see no other choice. And that was my daddy's way of not dropping his pride down enough to me, but telling me, yes, I've been saved. But the corruption was still there. And it did its work. It took him home, 1998. I'd have liked nothing better than it to heal him and for him to turn around and serve God with his life. But I knew God was going to let that corruption do its work. Thirdly, why corruption is good? Because it stops you, the believer, from wanting to continue on in your sin. It's an ultimate roadblock. I don't want to cause any more pain and suffering to myself. Like I asked you about the green persimmon, none of us went back for a second one, I promise you. It was terrible. Turn your wrong side out. And you, you know what? <laughs> Nobody had to tell you don't go back. The, the, the uh, caused you to not want to go back. The, I can't get this taste out of my mouth caused you to go, not go back. Amen? We learn the hard way. Corruption is good for us. Think about how terrible our world would be if there was not any consequences for our sin and we could just do whatever we wanted to do until we died. God said, well, you're saved. You know, that's how people look at, that's how lost people look at people that are saved. They say, you just say all you want to. You just do whatever you want to. You go into heaven. You've got to get out of the hell free card. You just do whatever you want. No, there's, there's consequences. There are consequences for our sin. And fear of corruption falling in your life or your children's life is a restraining fear that is given to us from a holy God who wants us to be holy just as He is. And don't make no difference we're old or young, rich or poor, holy or worldly, male or female. It is good for you to reap corruption because it makes you to where you don't want any more of it. Amen. So what am I going to do, preacher? What am I going to do? So here's what you were waiting for. What do I do? I mentioned that scripture at the beginning, Hosea 10, 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. That's what you do. You sow to yourselves in righteousness and reap in mercy. So that's what God tells us to do. So, so while you're reaping that corruption, sow to yourselves in mercy. Quit sowing to the flesh. Sow to yourselves in mercy. Do, do things that bring God's mercy into your life. You can't control the reaping, but you can control what you're sowing. You can't control what comes up, but you can control what's planted. So since you've been saved, hopefully you've been planting righteousness. Some people don't. Some people just kind of sit there, just kind of in neutral. Like God expects them to just wait on him. But no, that's not what God tells us to do. God tells us to sow in mercy, sow in righteousness. Sow in righteousness and reap in mercy. So again, since you've been saved, you supposedly have been planting righteousness, and while you're planting righteousness, along comes some corruption, pops up in the garden. You go, where did that come from? I didn't plant that. Huh? God? That wasn't supposed to... I didn't put that there, God. That's not supposed to be there now. I'm supposed to be gardening for you. I'm supposed to be doing things for you. That shouldn't be there in my garden of my life. And you say, Lord, I just don't understand that. Or I don't understand why my kid's suffering like he is and going through that. His life's a mess. Well, there it is. It came up over there. 
Or maybe you own up in years and you got gray on top of your head and your grandkids are doing some of the same stupid things you did. And you're like, oh man. Bad things happen to save people. It's as simple as that. Why is that? Because he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's why. And while that takes place, rather than getting bitter, getting mad, cursing God and giving up, sow to yourselves in righteousness and reap in mercy. The only thing going to help you in all of this is the mercy of God. That's all that's going to help you. And no matter what you have to read, God's mercy will get you through it. Amen? He promises you that. And if you will, it, it will give you help. It will give you patience to get through it all. It will give you courage in your darkest hour. And it will give you sustaining power. And I'm going to give you four things that you need to do if you want to reap in mercy. Okay? You say, I, I, okay, preacher, I want to do that. I want to reap in mercy. I want to sow in righteousness and reap in mercy like you said. Well, here's four things that you need to do if you want to do that. Number one, don't get mad at God. Don't get mad at God. Don't pay to, don't pay to get mad at God. Don't, don't dig yourself a deeper hole. Don't make it worse on yourself. God is your only hope. Why would you get mad at Him? And why would you get mad at Him for acting according to His Word and, and, and doing exactly what He said He would do? So don't get mad at him. Number one, don't get mad at God. Number two, don't hide from your past. Don't I listen, don't exploit it and glamorize it either, but don't hide from it. Okay? You take the blame so other people won't stand back and blame God. If you're having all this stuff come in your life, people say, I don't want to, why is all that happen? Just be just be bold and say, Well, I brought it on myself. It was stuff I did years ago, and it's all coming back in my life. And God's good, and He's going to get me through it. Don't hide. And on the other hand, don't vomit your sins upon the people. Don't go around telling everybody all the bad things you did all day. Nobody want to hear all that. right? But, but again, if you're questioned about something in your past, don't hide from it. Just admit it. There's forgiveness in the Lord. There's grace. And we've all had to have it, so we understand that. Don't make excuses for yourself is what I'm trying to say. Making excuses won't help you reap this stuff out. Number three, keep sowing in righteousness. Galatians 6, 9, our last verse in our text this morning, it says, let us not be weary in well-doing. Let's don't stop sowing in righteousness. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we'll keep serving God and keep doing what God wants us to do, keep loving Him, keep keeping our eyes on Him, keep walking in His Word, keep our prayer life strong, keep loving others as ourselves. God says that reap that you're going to eventually reap that righteousness, that mercy. It's going to come up. Just keep on sowing. Keep on sowing. Amen. Reaping it. Reaping that corruption while you're sowing that righteousness is a hard road to hoe. But God promises it gets better. It just keep going. Just keep going. God promises to help you. Just keep sowing in righteousness. Just keep going. And number four, it is right for you to ask for mercy. I talked about a mother's heart yesterday in that message. About the love that God puts into a mother's heart. And I was talking to the funeral director back behind the curtain there before we started. And I was telling him what I was going to talk about. I said, you know, I said, there's a difference between a mother and a mother with God's love. I said, God's love is not in every mother. If it was, there wouldn't be ones that leave their baby in dumpsters. There would be, hey, there was a woman left her child for 11 days while she went on vacation. I heard about that the other day. She left her young child to die of starvation while she went on vacation with a bunch of men. That woman don't have God's love. Now, those who have God's love, it's apparent that they have God's love because they love you with it. You know it. It's, it's, it's unconditional love. But the same God that put that kind of love and that kind of mercy into a mother's heart is the same one that we're asking for mercy. So when you come to God, you need to realize it's just like you coming to your own mother for help. Is she going to turn you away? No, because you're her child and she loves you. You're God's child and he loves you more than a mama loves you. I'm just giving you that as a point of reference. And the same mercy that he gave to a grandmother, and boy, ain't nobody got mercy like a grandmother. She'll fuss at your mama. Don't be so hard on them. 
You know, that kind of mercy. That's the same kind that God has in abundant supply. I'm going to tell you, I learned about that when I was a little boy. I think I'll tell you, y'all ain't got no word you know what I'm saying. Right? I was at Walmart with my, with my cousin and, and my grandmother and my great-grandmother when I was about nine years old. And, and we were over in the pet department. And uh, me and my cousin, we asked my great-grandmother, we want to get a couple gerbils. Can we get some gerbils? She said, oh, yeah, y'all get them. So she, she helped us get that stuff and get it in the buggy and get through the line and get out in the trunk of the car before my grandmother ever seen it because my grandmother was terrified of such as that. So we, we snuck it home and got it out and got it in my great-grandma's house and had it in one of the bedrooms, and we in there playing with our gerbils, and my grandmother come in and seen it. Oh, she threw the wildest fit you ever seen, and I hollered and screamed, and I saw my great-grandmother back her up against the wall and put her finger in her chest. And she said, you ain't going to talk to them down here like that, or you can go home. And I saw my grandma back down. The only time in my life I've ever seen her back down. My great-grandma had some mercy for her great-grandsons. Amen? I'll tell you right now, God is that kind of, He's got mercy for you. Amen? God has plenty of mercy. Listen to a man after God's own heart talk about it. Psalm 86, 15. But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and is in mercy and truth. Psalm 136, uh, verse, it's 26 verses of praise. And each one of them ends with the praise for His mercy endureth forever. If we come to him and say, Father, help me. I need mercy. I'm reaping corruption. He's going to send his Holy Spirit, the Comforter, to give us mercy that we need. And he will get you through it. You say, I, you don't understand what I'm going through. God can get you through anything. The devil will not help you at all. Amen. Do not listen to him in the middle of your reaping corruption. Right. So what I do, I tell you what you do. You come and you turn it over to God. And you let him have it. He loves you. And he's going to take care of you through it. Let's stand together. We're going to have a song of invitation here in just a moment. And if God spoke to your heart about something this morning, maybe you're going through something and you just need some prayer. Maybe, maybe you need to come to the altar and say, Lord, give me, give me grace to, to go through this, this corruption. Give me grace to reap this out. Lord, I need your mercy during this time. Whatever it is, God knows what you need and God will give you what you need, but you've got to come to Him and bring it to Him. Amen. If you can't come and kneel down because of your knees, sit down where you're at and pray. Uh, ain't nobody going to say a word to you. Just sit down where you're at and pray. But let, we're going to pray and we're going to sing. Number 118. Father, I thank you this morning. I thank you for the message. Lord God, please do a work in our lives. Help us and remind us daily that, Lord, even though we may be going through some things, it's our own fault. We brought it on ourselves. But, Lord, you'll give us the grace to get through it. You'll give us the grace to come through it victorious on the other side. And not only that, use it along the way to help somebody else who's going through similar things. Lord, I pray that you use this time now. You use the message, Lord. Work during this time to draw people to decisions for you. And, Lord, we'll give you glory and praise for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. 118. I need thee every hour. Most gracious Lord, no tender voice like mine can be so more. I need Thee, oh I need Thee, every hour I need Thee. Oh, my Savior, I come.
helped you. I hope that gave you some encouragement. And I hope it helped you understand a little bit maybe why we're going through some of the things we're going through. I tell you, I've I, I, I not made it out of the woods completely. i still got plenty of things that, that, that bother me and, and, and get under my skin and come back to haunt me. And again, I see these things in my own children. So it, it just takes God's grace. You know, something Mama said to me years and years and years ago still echoes in my head. I was at a low point. I had messed up so bad. And I won't say it was... I, I know when, when it was. It was February 2nd, 1996. And I had been running from God for about 20 years. And I was talking to her, and I was saying, Mama, I, at that time I didn't know a whole lot. I just said, Mama, I don't know. Maybe I need to get baptized again. And she was telling me, but you, you've already trusted Christ. You've already been baptized. You don't need to get baptized again. I said, well, I just, I just don't understand how I can still be saved after all the things I've done. And I, she said to me, she said, well, that's why you still need a Savior. You, st you ain't never going to find a time when you don't need Him. Amen? Listen, He's my Savior forever. Amen? Praise mm -hmm. God. Now, I'm thankful that He saved me. And even though i got to finish reaping out corruption, I, I, I wouldn't do it with anybody but Jesus. Amen? I thank God that He won't ever leave nor forsake us.